Tech and Salim is the founder of Dow5, a Web3 investment fund founded last year in 2022. Formerly, Tekken was at Polychain Capital. Dow5 is an experimental cryptocurrency investment fund that will convert into a decentralized autonomous organization, or a DAO. We dive into the biggest DAO drama from the last year, why Tekken is so bullish and excited about DAOs, Tekken's investment thesis while he was at Polychain, his switch to focus mostly on the Ethereum ecosystem at Dow5, Web3 infrastructure, NFTs, regulations, his thought on FTX, and so much more. Before we get into that, first, Tekken will tell us his current focus at Dow5. I spend my day-to-day in crypto managing a fund called Dow5. So for context, we're a $125 million crypto venture fund. We're focused on seed and pre-seed stage investing in, in new companies and protocols in the space. And in terms of our mandate, we're really allowed to invest in everything. So the full gamut of Layer 1s, DeFi, NFTs, crypto gaming, et cetera. But I'd say our focus since launch has been on crypto infrastructure. And I say that recognizing it can be a very generic term that's used in a lot of different ways. So what I mean more generally, or more specifically rather about infrastructure is any technology that fundamentally just helps improve the the functionality and performance of underlying layer one blockchains like Ethereum. So you could think of scalability technologies, uh, privacy tools, interoperability protocols, security, uh, things of that nature. Amazing. Well, I'm excited to dive into that a little bit more in a moment, but first would love to just learn how you got started in crypto initially. Yeah. um, My entry in crypto was a bit atypical. So I started in Toronto, Canada. It's where my family's from and where I grew up. And for most of my young life, I really didn't know what I wanted to do with the rest of my career and in the future. And I'm kind of one of those people that defaulted going to law school and becoming a corporate lawyer, Um, not because it's like something I was super passionate about or driven to do, just really at the time, I couldn't think of something better. And uh, I figured being a lawyer would be a good way to have like a respectable wage and and have a job where I at least learn a lot and get some uh, intellectual stimulation on a day-to-day basis. So there I was in Toronto in my mid-20s working as a M&A and securities lawyer at a big firm. And I kind of hit that point of disillusionment in my career. Um, I realized that corporate law wasn't for me. I didn't really like the culture of being at like a giant conservative corporate law firm. And this is really around the time that crypto found me as opposed to me finding crypto. And it came to me in the form of a friend of mine in 2016 who told me about this thing he just invested in called Ethereum. I remember looking at it briefly and immediately dismissing it as a scam. And it's really funny in hindsight to get back into like the mindset I had at the time. And of course, I thought of it as a scam because I was really indoctrinated to think of as a corporate lawyer. And here was this new financial asset that wasn't regulated and didn't have financial disclosures or or, uh, recurring cash flows or audits. And it didn't fit into the paradigm that I was trained to think in. So after he kept applying some peer pressure in early 2017 about how he was making all this money and it was going up, I kind of just like to shut him up, put a, put a little bit of money into Ethereum, expecting really to lose it. And um, quite to the contrary, it just kept slowly appreciating as the market was growing throughout 2017. And I kind of became intrigued and said, huh, I, I should probably learn a little bit more about what's going on under the hood. What is this Ethereum thing all about? And spent my 10,000 hours on Medium, Twitter, uh, doing a lot of reading, doing a lot of reading about kind of just like the base of of cryptography and computer science and distributed systems that underpins these systems, as well as what was happening in this ICO landscape. Um, And I think when I really had my aha moment, funny enough, was when I read about the DAO in 2016. And it was a strange conversion because the DAO was still really considered this like black mark on the history of Ethereum and this big public failure of uh, this new idea and technology. But to me, it was such an eye opener. I thought even though this DAO failed, the concept that you can have these on-chain business entities that um, basically blend the roles of what we would, as corporate lawyers, traditionally think of as shareholders and creditors and managers and, and employees into this one cohort of token holder where everyone has the same incentives. And the, the objective of this organization can be determined by governance. That was just a, a total eye-opener. So um, as you know yourself, once you're red-pilled in crypto, there's really no going back. Um, so I couldn't last much longer as a corporate lawyer. I quit my job without really having a plan. And it's about mid to late 2017. 
I just kind of showed up at a bunch of different crypto conferences, meeting with early stage teams, building on Ethereum. I offered a lot of teams to help them using everything I'd learned as a lawyer, help them with fundraising, uh, regulatory strategy, tax structuring, um, raising capital, et cetera. And also was writing a lot and kind of getting published with my thoughts and ideas about corporate governance and crypto at the time. And by the end of 2017, I was approached by an early fund at the time, Polychain Capital. Uh, the employee, the first employee there basically reached out to me and said, hey, Tekken, we see you're being super scrappy, showing up at crypto conferences, offering teams to help. Why don't you join Polychain and just do the same thing you're doing specifically for our portfolio? So I flew to San Francisco, interviewed, um, got offered a job and accepted it quickly. And, and kind of the rest is history. Amazing. Yeah. The biggest piece of advice I always lend to anyone that wants to break into crypto is just go to events because I think a lot of opportunities come from that. Would you agree with that? And then any other advice you would have for maybe someone who wants to follow a similar path as you have from, from law? Absolutely. Um, I think that is the best advice. You both expose yourself to opportunities and really you learn by osmosis. When I think of what really accelerated my learning the most, um, maybe even more than just like the countless hours you might spend on on Twitter or Reddit or, or Medium reading about ideas is being that fly in the wall on conversations that are happening at a high level and being able to hear the discourse and then be a party to that back and forth, I think just really um, accelerates your, your learning in the space. And yeah, I do think that for for my fellow former lawyers who are still working in that space, if anyone has the desire to transition or whatever you are really in your own career arc, I do think just taking the shot and maybe doing it at a time when it feels more counterintuitive is the best time to do it as opposed to doing it when it's heard like behavior. Like in late 2021, I probably wouldn't have advised a lot of friends to quit their jobs and go work at NFT projects. Um, just an example, but doing it when it feels a little more contrarian is the best time. Totally agree. Yes. When things go mainstream, I think that's oftentimes when you have to question things. Uh, and then I would love to double click into your time at Polychain as one of the top investors in the space. What was that? What was that like? Yeah, totally. Um, it was an amazing experience. So when I joined in 2017, I actually it was such a rush to move from Toronto to San Francisco that I didn't have an apartment or anything. Um, I was actually just living at the office, which was a residential apartment and sleeping at an air mattress and working up, waking up and working at the same place all day. And then like speaking about crypto all night and going back to sleep. So 2017 crypto had a very different feel. I think, um, Polychain at the time was five employees. I believe I was the fifth person to join. Uh, we were in the hundreds of millions in AUM and, and working out of that residential office I described a residential apartment rather. And by the time I left in 2021, we had grown to about 40 employees. We had a really large uh, office in the Embarcadero in San Francisco, managing multiple different funds, multiple different operating companies, and in the billions of AUM. So um, it was an am amazing arc and learning experience. I think the whole ecosystem grew significantly, as did we as a business. And as I mentioned, my first gig at Polychain was kind of the portfolio support guy. So the idea being, once Polychain invests in a new protocol, um, Tekken gets introduced as the guy that helps the founders with everything they need post-investment. So be it like recruiting, legal, community management, partnerships, a lot of things that frankly, I wasn't very qualified to do. I, I kind of learned on the job. And just by being so close to founders at the inception of these companies, uh, you start to learn the anatomy of an early stage crypto startup and how you can be as helpful as possible. Also, you can apply the learnings from company A to company B. Um, so I feel like it was a phenomenal opportunity to just really get to know how this all worked. Um, and then over the following year or two, I started to move upstream within Polychain. So because I had a legal background and, and spent a lot of time on transactions, I kind of took the role of leading the commercial negotiation and structuring of every investment we made from the fund. So in that process, I obviously learned a lot about the mechanics of how to structure a crypto investment, what type of investor protections are, are reasonable. Um, also kind of like what are the market norms in terms of terms between founders and investors. So having joined in 2017, I think I've probably like structured more investments and, and negotiated more investments than any investor in the space, but uh, also started spending more time on the actual investment thesis of our organization and originating my own deals. So uh, it really spanned a bunch of different things within the entity. 
Amazing. And I guess for the founders listening, what would you say is the most traditional way to structure uh, a fundraise now? Would it be a, a SAFT? Would it be a token conversion on a safe? What would you say it would be? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's it's pretty jurisdiction dependent, but assuming it's kind of like US or somewhere in uh, the Western hemisphere, we usually see this at a seed stage, safe plus token warrant structure. Um, that's something that actually Polychain and Andreessen, a deal that we co-led, were the first to use. And a part of it is tax optimization. And usually uh, the plan is this company is ultimately going to dissolve and what they're building truly is a decentralized network. So the safe might not have any economic value, like there isn't a centralized business model and the safes may, na- may not even ever convert. But it's really just a mechanism for corporate governance for investors so that, um, yeah, there's some recourse if if there's like legal issues that were with the founder. Got it. Yeah, I know a lot of founders, kind of new founders in the space struck, struggle with that because it is different than the traditional space. So I think that's super helpful. And then I also love the grind. I think that there's a common misconception that you have to have the perfect experience and you have to have done everything before to break into crypto full time. And I think your case is a is a prime example of how that's not true. Uh, and it is such a new industry that you can really apply almost any skill set to the space. Uh, So I love that. And then how did you choose to go the investing path as opposed to maybe the building or founder path yourself? Yeah, thank you. Um, And in terms of the grind, the other misconception is people think you have to perfectly nail timing, like you have to join right at the beginning of a bull market, which is entirely false. I joined Polychain in December 2017. Like, if you look at it with a narrow timeline, I couldn't have gotten timing worse. But if you have the conviction to stick it out, like, this is a long process and crypto has always really been a get rich slow industry as opposed to get rich fast. So it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, to return to your question, I guess like even when I was a corporate lawyer, I was just really passionate about investing. And it's kind of like, I've heard this term thrown around. I think I read it in Ethereum blog early that I'm a scanner. I'm kind of someone who has so much conviction um, across many, many things as opposed to being like all in on one thing. And I really like the idea of being able to learn about a specific industry and then move on and learn about another. Uh, that's kind of what drew me to corporate law to begin with. And I think having that portfolio theory approach as an investor is very appealing to me. It lets me focus on what I'm good at and spread it across multiple companies. Um, the other is I, I just think like the builders, the, the best projects are built by very, very strong technical teams. And I come from a non-technical background. So my job really and my skill set is to support technical founders and, and be of service to them. Totally. But you need someone to translate the tech. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't get used as, as much as it, it probably could have. Uh, and then what was your investment thesis? I know you mentioned that you worked on that while at Polychain. Would love to kind of double click into what that was. I know Polychain was big into layer ones at one point. So yeah, I would love to hear about it. Yeah, totally. Um, I think when you look at just the whole history of crypto funds and any of them that have had real success, it's usually because they've called at least one trend very early and had a few winners in that category before it emerged. Um, As an example, just looking at, for instance, Framework Ventures, which is a fund that I actually have a lot of respect for, they really made the name for themselves on DeFi summer in 2020. They were the big investors in Aave, Synthetics, um, Chainlink, a lot of the protocols that kind of led that momentum. And for Polychain, we are some of the biggest OGs in the crypto investing space. And I think we got two things right fundamentally. One is what you said. um, In the era of 2017, 2018, there were a lot of alt layer ones launching. So it was kind of like Ethereum was the only game in town in terms of developer ecosystem building smart contracts. But Polychain were big investors in Cosmos, Polkadot, Tezos, uh, Avalanche, etc., Um, A lot of these were just alternative layer ones that had some innovation relative to Ethereum or or differentiation. The other big thing is the very, very first wave of DeFi protocols. So I'm talking like before DeFi was even a term used in the space. Uh, DYDX, ZeroX, Compound, Dharma. Um, I, I think those were the biggest two segments we got right. And I was always very excited about the former. Like helping these alternative layer ones build ecosystems was, I think, one of the most emergent kind of like exciting areas in 2017, 2018. Um, And it's interesting because I think like there wasn't a playbook for this at the time. You look at crypto today in a world with Solana, Nier, um, Avalanche, Ethereum, and like both EVM compatible and non-EVM compatible chains. 
they all have unique ecosystems. They all have largely taken the same kind of like playbook on how to bootstrap their own communities. But um, as an example, like we did the first ecosystem funds in the space in early 2018. We created an ecosystem fund for Polkadot, one for Celo, and one for um, Definity. And there wasn't like a concept of this then. It's just more like, how do we try to compete with what Ethereum's built in terms of developer community and bootstrap that from day one? So what I feel like was the most exciting were those conversations with founders about kind of coming up with strategies to really drive an organic developer community around these new platforms. Amazing. And then I would love to hear maybe your favorite story from helping a founder post an investment from Polychain, if you have one. Sure. I'll I'll skim one because I like to think of what you learn from the bad experiences or the hard times. But um, pre-launch of Definity for ICP, we tried to set up like the biggest at the time airdrop done to date. And this is because, as you remember, like after 2017, securities laws in the US made it effectively like very difficult to do a a public crowd sale. So we wanted to do an airdrop to get more community aligned with the project. And um, I think we had something like 60,000, 65,000 people on this list. And we started working with all the backend providers like the KYC, um, AML, checking, etc. And towards the end, we realized after doing this airdrop, that it had been civil attack by like members of the Chinese community that were using multiple, multiple, like sometimes in the case of one person, over a hundred fake IDs that they bought online in the black market to pretend to be one person and qualify for the airdrop repeatedly, repeatedly. So going through the data after the fact and kind of like skimming out, deduplicating who was fraudulent and, and excluding them, that was not the most fun experience, but we definitely learned a lot about the type of civil protection and the type of attack vectors that are prevalent in all areas of crypto. Like you have to have that security hat on at all times when you try to do anything on a large scale in crypto. Totally. Yeah. And I would love to kind of double click into DAO5 and understand a little bit more about your current fund thesis and strategy. DAO5, as I mentioned, is a seed stage venture fund. And from the perspective of LPs, it's pretty similar in terms of structure as any other venture fund in the space. Um, the one nuance is our plan uniquely is to convert a portion of the fund into a DAO at the end of the fund life cycle. So what that means is from an LP's perspective, it's just like another fund. You uh, get called on capital over a course of several years, the investment period. And at the end, you get you receive distributions as positions are, are sold or liquidated. Um, but when the fund is kind of returned, we want to take the general partner entity of the fund and turn it into a DAO. So this would be kind of like the investment manager that all the investment team and myself have equity in. We want to take that, turn the cap table into a token table, and then effectively dilute all of us to give some amount of ownership to all the founders that we've backed in the portfolio. So it's a little bit of an experiment, but my goal is for the end state of DAO5 to be this kind of collective of founders that co-manage a pool of capital, as opposed to kind of like ending up as a traditional venture fund. I just think it's more fun. It's more crypto native. And I'm also very excited about where DAOs are going. So I want to be a part of this future. I love that. So exciting. And I'm also finding now that a lot of projects look to uh, investors that have similar experience on the builder side or the founder side. So that's super interesting. And then where did you get kind of the motivation behind creating something like this? And and how have you kind of gone about putting it into action? Yeah, I think... um, A big part of the motivation is it's always prudent to launch, especially for a fund, but for really any business, like you want to launch a product or a company that you think is going to be at the center of relevance in like five years from now. It's not about doing what's working today. It's about doing what's going to work in the future and building towards that. So I recognize that like leaving Polychain to launch my own fund, I can't just recreate what worked for Polychain in 2017 and 2022 and expect to have the same success. So I wanted to do something um, a little more innovative and kind of just like experimental. And also, I think a big part of that is I don't live in the U.S. Um, Being outside of the U.S. makes it a little bit easier in terms of regulatory jurisdiction and structure to do something like this. But I do think collectively the space needs to still have more clarity on um, DAO governance and DAO regulation. So hopefully the timing aligns well and in five years or so when the fund term is up, that there'll be enough clarity to do this in a really, really like secure and and compliant way. Amazing. I love that. And can you share a few of the projects that you've backed thus far? Sure. So um, I'll give you a couple of examples. As I mentioned, we're very focused on infrastructure. So I look at 
things that improve kind of those like core tenants of Ethereum. Uh, one project you're probably familiar with is Layer Labs, or Eigenlayer is the main product. Uh, we were in the seed round of Eigenlayer. And actually, Sri Ram Kanan, the founder, is an advisor to the fund. Um, so this is an example of a product that kind of is core to Ethereum, but effectively lets ETH validators restake their ETH to provide security to other chains and also mint kind of like rewards or earn rewards from other app chains or other blockchains for providing that security. Um, I think it fits well into this thesis of modularity and, and making things more interoperable within the space. Also, it, like you see so many instances where projects want to launch some, whether it's like an isolated VM or an app or even a competing L1, it doesn't always make sense to bootstrap your own set of validators just because you're never going to have the same uh, security as, as Ethereum, or at least it'll take a very long time to compete with that. Um, it, it, it's just beneficial for the whole space to kind of like bootstrap this decentralized base of validators that Ethereum already has. What's the incentive model of Eigenlayer, if you can share? Yeah, they're going to have their own native token that it, like, I don't think this is all figured out, but because the core value is restaking ETH, it's possible that you'll also have to stake the, the Eigen token in addition to that. So you subject both assets to slashing risk. Um, there's also other products that they're working on, like their own data availability layer. Very cool. Yeah. And then we'd love to hear any others that, that you've supported that you're excited about. Yeah. So um, another example, again, it's kind of like a part of this worldview that Ethereum is rapidly growing and, and arguably the, the winner of the future in terms of like world compute is going to be a roll-up centric Ethereum. There's a project called Altlayer, which is started by a guy um, who previously ran Parity Asia. So Parity, I think, has some of the best dev talent in the space. Uh, he also was the CTO of Zilliqa before, so it already built a multi-billion dollar ecosystem and project. Um, the vision for Altlayer is, again, it's more in, in line with optimistic rollups, but it's kind of like for ap most applications, there's actually limited windows when you're going to have an extreme uh, overhead of, of transaction throughput. So you could think of it as like an ICO or an NFT minting event. This is a narrow window where you're going to have very high throughput and then it's going to normalize after. It lets projects spin up like disposable optimistic rollups. So it, it basically alleviates that overhead for narrow periods of time. And then um, you can discard that rollup layer after the fact. Again, another experimenting kind of like scalability and, and cost efficiency for Ethereum. Super interesting. And what's the incentive model for that one? TBD. I think it's it's actually like the most important question in the space. But also when you think of how our understanding of token value has changed so much over time, it's like sometimes I even wonder what the next wave of token economics will be. Um, and I say this like looking backwards at a time when everything was just a governance token that it, that didn't uh, receive any value. And like what was defensible then isn't really defensible now. And you realize that in hindsight, that was probably just a regulatory ARP to make the thing not seem like a security. Uh, but I, I do think the token models are going to be a continued area of research in the space. Absolutely. Yeah. With the graph, we spent about two years just designing the token incentives before ever putting developer resources behind the network. And I, I think it's a really important question. But to your point, when you're backing early stage founders, you kind of have to trust that they're going to figure it out. Are you looking for a stress-free crypto life in 2023? Forget about the hassles and go self-custodial with One Inch. The One Inch Wallet is the single app you need to manage crypto. Your One Inch Wallet acts as a safe box due to hardware wallet connection, becomes your ultimate coin storage when adding custom tokens, offers full versatility thanks to multi-chain support, easy to use, secure, and self-custodial. Try One Inch now. Amazing. And I find it interesting that you, you know, you were very focused on many different layer one ecosystems, but you kind of come back to Ethereum. And I do think like the tooling around Ethereum had a, a huge head start, but I would love to just kind of hear your perspective on that and why you've kind of returned to the Ethereum ecosystem mostly. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fair point and it's easy to, I guess, look like a hypocrite from the outside, but it's really a source of cognitive dissonance to me. Like I'm very much of two minds when it comes to this question. On one hand, I think it's logical to be ecosystem agnostic and a great application or a great technology is a great application or great technology irrespective of which platform it's implemented on. And this is all especially true as we move towards a more interoperable and modular world for blockchains. 
where it's more seamless to get from chain to chain. It really doesn't matter. But the other part of me just recognizes how strong Ethereum's community is, and I'm such a deep believer in it. And with each passing year and each passing cycle, I think Ethereum becomes really stronger relative to other L1 communities. And to date, there's been no amount of like VC hype or funding that's been able to dissolve the kind of quality and resolve or, or displace the quality and resolve of the Ethereum community. And projects like, and this is maybe an extreme example, but like who even remembers EOS anymore? Like it doesn't matter how many billions they raise or how much they watch trade their own token. Um, to beat Ethereum, it's like, it's not going to be easy to do because it's such a decentralized movement for the people. It's not like, it's the one chain that doesn't feel like there's some company that's trying to make a billion dollars off the back of retail. It's truly for the benefit of the world. And um, Vitalik is one of the few uh, missionaries in the space and he, he's by no means a mercenary. Absolutely. I completely agree. And network effects are super powerful. But I do think the future will be multi-chain. And I guess mm -hmm. with that comes the question of how do you get um, tokens from one chain to the next chain safely? What are your thoughts on that? Thoughts on bridges, if you have any? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think like the whole space has converged on this need for a long time. This was the original vision for Cosmos and Polkadot. It's the bet, like we need interoperability, so why not create the same development framework that um, every blockchain will be in the same specification, thus making it easy to move across. Um, a little bit of obviously differences between the two projects in terms of how the security model works. And I feel like the second iteration for that were in the last few years, we've seen a number of projects that kind of create open standards for cross-chain messaging or, or token transfers, things like Acceler, Layer Zero, uh, Nomad. and all of this, I believe, is a part of the same thesis. Uh, the first wave of bridges we saw last year, the biggest issue really is security. Um, you probably saw the same report that if you add up all of the DeFi hacks and bridge hacks over the last year, it's like over a billion and a half dollars were stolen. That is not sustainable. And, and that's like the biggest core problem in the space. There's hopefully a, a, a variety of technologies and, and companies that are going to help address this. I don't think security for bridges is like a single solution. But we obviously need better and more scalable code auditing firms, um, hopefully even like a development language and framework like Move, which in theory is supposed to be more secure than Solidity, will play a factor. Um, we also have to encourage more hackers to be white hat and not black hat. Um, I guess one timely uh, piece of news is the whole Avi Eisenberg arrest. And it's like going to be really interesting to see how this frames our thinking and precedent legally for like white hat or, or black hat hacking in the space. Yeah. And for those listening, can you double click into that arrest and, and everything that happened around there? Sure. I, I, I'm not the most in the know on this, but at a high level, Avi's been a pretty Twitter prolific trader and, and run a prop shop for some time. He's also very open publicly about um, kind of gaming exploits in, in protocols or, or systems designs issues is probably a better way to think of it. And when you look at all of his strategy from the perspective of code is law, and that's like the absolute axiom of, of how you should look at the space, everything he's doing is, is kind of like legal and onside. But after exploiting Mango Markets, kind of like he exploited the Oracle and was able to drain, I think, something in the order of like 100 million from the protocol. He was negotiating with the community. First, he took responsibility for that exploit and then negotiated with the co community to return something like half the money. And um, before those negotiations could finish, he was arrested in Puerto Rico. So um, I, I do feel like on one hand, exploits are bad. On the other, this could be bearish DeFi. Um, there's like an argument that it is healthy in a sense to have these protocols and these, these um, DeFi platforms hardened. You want people to compromise and look for bugs. You just want them to be sufficiently white hat where they get a reasonable reward for doing it. But probably don't rug retail for like $50 million. Totally. Yeah. I kind of am of the mindset that code is law. But if you look at something like the Dow, where it was rolled back because the governance allowed for it to be, what are, where do you kind of stand on, on the code is law statement? I think code is law is more of a principle than a final rule. I believe the intent is a huge factor as well. Um, like, there's reentrancy bugs in all of these things. It doesn't mean that that was intended. I think that it's still a hack and an exploit. And there has to be like a balance of factors considered. Um, 
And more, I, I think of this as how do we kind of just circumvent the need for all this stuff to go to litigation in order to get the results we want. And I just think we need better incentives for white hat hackers. So one thing I backed is called Pwn No More, which is a category I'm really excited about. It's just a really strong collective of white hat hackers and security engineers that are building this like white hat DAO. So effectively, this is going to go look for exploits, reentrancy bugs, things like that across a variety of platforms and, and hopefully by reporting them, receive some bounty and, and reward. Um, it has to be economic to, to do things the right way in order for this to really take off and to incentivize the right security for the space. Yeah, I like that view. And it's almost like the smart contracts are like regulators in a sense, because you find these bugs, you patch them up, and the system kind of fixes itself. Just like with regulations, people circumvent the regulations, and then you have to patch it up. Uh, but it's much more effective and, and efficient, in my opinion. Uh, any thoughts yeah. on that kind of with your legal hat on? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, I have this like, this is why we can't have nice things view of the last year. And when I think of this um, kind of like rush to focus on regulation in the space, a part of it is because anyone, any se like sensible outsider who looks at what happened in 2021 recognizes there was a lot of bad acting. There was a lot of excess. Um, there was just like so much retail money duped into products that are financial napalm. And I, I do agree that there has to be solutions to this bad acting. We have to make the barrier for entry higher. It shouldn't just be that like any snake oil salesman can start an NFT project and hire like a digital artist online and, and raise a million dollars overnight. This is like net net bad behavior. But I also think that like the question is, has regulation, at least in some areas, created more benefit or more harm for consumers? And there are inverse effects where like you understand the principle of the rule, but the fact that DYDX had to exclude US recipients from their airdrop and they couldn't receive like 70 grand for free on a retail basis. And, and this is life changing money for so many people. And like, is the SEC really doing a good job protecting people from by excluding them from this airdrop? Um, and I have a little bit of a deeper view to this, but I actually think one of the biggest issues in the space, and if you look at projects that have held sustainable value as tokens over like multiple years, Quint, like returning to the example of Polkadot, Cosmos, some of these things, a lot of these were ICOs that had a lot of participants and didn't have lockups. And these have performed better, much better than some of the VC backed coins of the following years. And because of the securities law uncertainty and how hard it's become to do an ICO, um, you now have multiple rounds of VC funding before any of these tokens get to retail. And there's far too much VC money ready to dump on retail. I just think that balance is off. And because there's so much regulatory uncertainty and everyone's scared to do some type of retail distribution, you kind of end up hurting retail more than benefiting them. Totally. Yeah, a lot of founders are kind of backed into corners. And also, I think your point that there are a lot of negative, a lot of negative externalities that come with some of these regulations that aren't always thought through. And if you look at what, what happened with FTX, regulators are kind of to blame because one, they pushed FTX overseas, so it couldn't be regulated here in the US. But two, they didn't let anyone in the US provide the products. There was so much demand on FTX for derivatives and, and other products like that. So yeah, it's super mm -hmm. interesting to, to think about. Yeah, I totally agree. And I just think it's important for regulators to be very um, thoughtful in differentiating, like regulating a private company that holds retail users' coins on their behalf or, or their manages their private keys. That's one thing. It's very different than trying to regulate a piece of software on, on a blockchain. Um, and I think the two can get conflated and there's like a little bit of sleight of hand that happens there where you justify FTX to, man to regulate DeFi. And, and to me, that doesn't make a ton of sense. Like the two are diametrically opposed. Totally. And if anything, it shows that CeFi needs to be regulated and DeFi was just fine. So uh, yeah, super yeah. interesting. And then I guess with your focus on Web3 infrastructure, it feels as though we've kind of solved scaling with layer twos on Ethereum. What is the next big hurdle in your opinion? Obviously, kind of interoperability and getting tokens across chains. Anything else that we should be thinking about solving? Yeah, I think we talked about security quite a bit. And um, we can't have another year where over a billion dollars is just stolen and in kind of like preventable bugs. So I, I do think frameworks like Move are going to be really interesting. Although I have my my criticisms of of chains like Aptos, I do think that the language itself and the VM is probably going to be really interesting. And implementing that within other ecosystems will be useful. 
Um, beyond that, like one area, and it's something that I would have never invested in in the past, but I think that we're in a very different world and, and market now is real world assets. Folks are speaking more and more about like wrapping real world assets and putting them on chain now. And like, I was never in 2017, 2018 interested in security tokens or like, we're going to put real estate on the blockchain. I always thought like run for the hills when someone pitches you that. But um, in a higher interest rate environment where it's much harder to generate returns, um, it's no longer a world where like growth is the only metric that matters. We're returning to cash flows and profitability and just like defensibility. Bringing some of these asset classes into crypto in some type of compliant way where like you can have a crypto derivative that represents these things is very appealing just because um, the unfortunate reality of markets is like the best opportunities are limited to accredited investors and, and beyond that, like insiders that have access to these private debt funds and these real estate funds and these unique strategies. And retail is generally left with, with kind of like the lowest alpha category of, of financial assets to invest in. So I think the beauty of crypto is that these things trade 24 seven, they're, they're, they can trade from any address to any address. Being able to wrap those things and put them on chain, I think is very appealing. Totally. Yeah. A lot of transparency and ownership. And if you think back to the mortgage back crisis, the reason the dominoes fell so far was because we didn't know where the bonds were. And so if you put that on the blockchain, it's much more efficient. But again, mm -hmm. you're kind of blocked when it comes to regulations there. So hopefully we can find a path forward. Um, and then I would love to kind of understand how you navigated the hard year of 2022 with the fund and, and how you, you're kind of thinking about it in hindsight now. Yeah. So I actually didn't find 2022 to be a super hard year because I was fortunate that I was launching right at the beginning of 2022. So I was primarily in dry powder and I've lived through a few cycles. So I was not like the person who launched January 1st and was like, let's deploy the fund. I, I was very conservative, slow, focused on what I thought was very defensible companies at a very early stage. Um, and I knew that there was so much excess in 2021 that still needed to be wiped from the market. So that whole process obviously started with the Luna collapse. And as we saw three arrows fall, Celsius, et cetera, it started to become more and more apparent that a big part of what drove 2021 was a credit bubble. Like there was so much uh, debt in the space. There was a lot of leverage. And the the risk analysis on on some of these loans was like shockingly low to non-existent. And like just being conservative and opportunistic about when things felt they were peak bloody is the best time to start actively deploying. So um, I'm still mostly undeployed and yeah, just took a very conservative approach over the last year. Amazing. Yeah, that's great to hear. And then a lot of funds kind of raised a lot of money, massive, massive funds. Are, are a lot of fund managers kind of having trouble calling in that money to deploy, even though they did technically raise it? What are your thoughts there? I've heard mixed things. Again, a lot of this is through the grapevine. Um, I think the really big funds that predominantly have institutional LPs, be it other venture funds, fund of funds, uh, pensions, like sovereign wealth, those pools of capital never really default. They're, they're kind of like agnostic to what the economic conditions are. If they sign a contract, they sign a contract. But I do think a lot of the smaller, scrappier funds that raise from a lot of family offices or entrepreneurs, um, especially the ones that raise from other just crypto native people. So all their friends were crypto rich. So they all decided to back someone. Uh, a lot of those folks don't have the capital they thought they had a year ago. So I am hearing instances where uh, some LPs aren't able to make commits. Yeah, super interesting. And it's helpful to kind of think about it in those terms. And then I would love to double click into DAOs. Uh, you being bullish on DAOs, I would love to understand why you're so excited about DAOs and what other people should be thinking about when it comes to DAOs. Yeah, no, great question. Um, so the first thing is we're very, very early in this journey. Like when you one day when we look back on the history of DAOs, the way one can look at like the history of public companies or, or, or corporate governance, we're pretty much in the proof of concept stage. Uh, we haven't had anything meaningfully successful. Uh, just thinking of some of the DAOs that were in the news cycle a lot in 2021, things like Constitution DAO and Assange DAO, these were successful in one right. Like I think they proved how effective DAOs are at raising large amounts of capital across large amounts of constituents for some cause. Like in this way, it's one of the most effective fundraising tools in the history of capital formation. But both of those examples actually failed for different reasons. Um, they failed on execution and decision-making and management. That's where the biggest issues lie today with DAOs. 
no one's really cracked a way to just keep governance engaged. And I think a big part of that is the incentives aren't entirely there. Um, so if you go to most DAO forums today, like they're just kind of like graveyards for governance. There's like really nothing happening. And a part of that is just because you need to have the buck stop with someone. There has to be someone that still has the incentive to, to lead this forward. Otherwise, you end up with this tragedy of commons, which is like a adverse or, or negative effect that we talk about a lot in crypto. And I do think most DAOs are, are going through some form of tragedy of the commons. Um, I'm a big believer in this concept of Dunbar's number, which more broadly is like the idea that social groups break down above a certain number. I think Dunbar's number is 150 specifically. But if you have a DAO of like millions of users that all have a very, very, very small stake, who's going to actually lead the work? Who has the incentive to do something innovative? Um, I have like ideas on how to best address that, but I do think that's like the biggest issue that is in the space. Super interesting. And for those listening who might not know what we mean when we say governance, can you break it down for them? Yeah. Like the magic of DAOs is that for every key decision, every token holder can vote um, usually like commensurate with, with how many tokens they hold of the total amount. So your voice is heard in a way that it's not actually heard in practice. If you're like a retail shareholder of Apple, um, you can actually ha also have the transparency of seeing your vote relative to everyone else on every decision. And, um, that is one of the like really special features of, of DAO governance or DAOs in general. Amazing. And when you think about, so I know Optimism had a recent kind of interesting token structure when it came to governance. Any thoughts on how they went about it? Um, I actually haven't followed Optimism's token structure. Do, can you tell me a little bit about what they're proposing? Yeah. So they, they have like a two-sided governance uh, token, one for the community and one for the VCs. So it's just interesting mm. kind of to break it down that way, because otherwise what you can, what you can see is that a lot of VCs have all the voting rights within DAOs. So any thoughts on, on that? Yeah. So that to me makes a ton of sense. And I think the learning for that probably came out of what I think was like the biggest DAO controversy of the last year, um, which is tribe DAO. I, I don't know if you followed tribe DAO, but in December 2021, like there was the biggest DAO on DAO merger we've really seen in the history of space. Of the space, uh, Fay Protocol merged with Rari. Combined value was like $2 billion in this merger. So even like in terms of public m &A, it would be considered a big deal. But where things really got complex is that like Fay as a stablecoin system had a bunch of different stakeholders. And Rari as like a, a set of different lending pools had a bunch of different stakeholders. When you combine the two, there are so many different stakeholders within one DAO. And not a lot of clarity on how their like rights and interests rank relative to one another. By the way, this is like the same framework people use in bankruptcy law, and it's something that's going to come up a lot in FTX. Um, but it's a very, very complicated area of corporate governance. And corporate governance has the benefit of like hundreds of years of precedent and trial and error and, and legislation to shape this. This was really the first instance where we had to deal with it in a DAO context. So um, sometime mid last year, certain lenders in Rari got hacked. Like there was a big compromise in a part of the tribe DAO ecosystem. And there were significant losses uh, shared across like certain stakeholders. Then the whole DAO kind of like dissolved to infighting and, and the question of who should be reimbursed using capital? What's the best way to unwind this and, and make people whole? Do the token holders get to be made 100%, but the, the victims of the hack, the lenders in Rari, do they have to just suffer those losses? Do you socialize the losses? Um, and one of the controversies is in the voting process between the founders and like Andreessen and maybe one other fund, they were able to just come to a majority rule. So um, what good is your DAO vote if in effect, there's like a small group of insiders that have 100% control? So I, I think this really pushed to the forefront, this conversation of, look, VCs are not really in the same category as retail, and maybe they should have different governance rights, or maybe um, for certain issues, some holders should be able to vote as a class. And it sounds like optimism is now leading experimentation and kind of like along those lines. And I'm excited to see more experimentation come out of this. Totally. Yeah. So much innovation is happening and I'm excited for us to kind of cr crack the code in the future to really uh, nail governance. And then one thing I'm passionate about Web3 and crypto, a lot of the things, a lot of the problems in the world boil down to incentive issues and coordination issues. And I think with DAOs, we can start to align ourselves online to really tackle big challenges in the world. So do you agree with that? And then so let's say we fast forward five years. What are some of the issues that you hope DAOs are kind of helping to, to solve for? 
Yeah, I think fast forwarding maybe like five to 10 years, I'm so bullish on DAOs. I believe that just the sheer quantum of AUM, the number of DAOs, the f- sophistication of how they operate, and even just the tooling and like the basic software that's missing from the space right now, all of those gaps will be filled in and it'll be like a very, very different future. I think on the investment side, there will be some DAOs that rival the size and AUM of the biggest capital allocators in the world today. And these will be constituents of maybe tens of thousands of people, but they'll probably operate on a more localized framework. Like they'll have hundreds of sub DAOs beneath this master DAO and sub DAOs are able to make decisions autonomously, but it, there's this constant liquid democracy. So at any point, if like a sub DAO is abusing its power or, or failing to perform, um, the, the management of that sub DAO can be voted out and replaced with someone else. Uh, so I do think it's going to be really interesting to see how this evolves. Um, I think like the most obvious use case is we saw this community momentum about Wall Street bets, and it's probably like a bit depressing in those forums these days. But I love in principle the idea of retail investors banding together and making their own kind of like forum-based hedge fund to compete with some of the biggest hedge funds in the world. And um, I thought there was like some real value to that, although it kind of ran rampant with some of these meme stocks. I think like with a proper DAO structure, you can have a much more sophisticated version of something that looks like a retail hedge fund. Um, and then obviously platforms like Patreon and et cetera, where you can raise money for narrow causes, for social causes, whatever. I think DAOs are going to be the best framework for doing that in the world. Amazing. Yeah, I love that. And then what have you learned about DAOs that you find surprising in hindsight or maybe a new insight that you can share? I really think it's it's just the fact that like, They've been so dysfunctional and no one's been able to manage a way to keep people engaged over long periods of time. Um, I looked at a few Dow fundraises in 2021, and I remember some of them managed to pull it off at really high valuations, like the Friends with Benefits and the Pleaser Dows. I actually think those are two great examples in that the way they approach community building is they really started off as these tight cohorts of like like-minded friends and then slowly opened up and decentralized over time. And I think that's one way that you can avoid a tragedy of commons is being relevant and engaging and doing cool things like buying the Wu-Tang album from Martin Shkreli's uh, auction. Uh, I I think like doing things like that to make a name while slowly opening up is a little bit more thoughtful as opposed to trying to onboard like thousands of users overnight and expect that people will be engaged in care. So um, I guess the biggest learning is just that you have to be slow and deliberate, which is kind of the approach we want to take with the future DAO 5 DAO. Totally. Yeah. You kind of have to solve how to be exclusive, yet also inclusive. Yeah, exactly. And, and for those that don't know, uh, Friends with Benefits or Pleaser DAO, can you give us the, the TLDR on, on each of those DAOs? Yeah, they're both kind of what I would categorize. There's different types of DAOs, but they're both like social and art focused. Um, I think Pleaser DAO's first thing was buying like the doge nft and fractionalizing it and selling it they also made a name for themselves as i said buying uh this like really new like f- focused in the meme cycle and new cycle martin shkreli's like uh exclusive album from wu-tang clan they bought it from his prison auction and started making a name in mainstream media and they would just constantly look at like cool opportunistic things to do in art and culture to, to buy unique assets and uh friends with benefits is a little bit more focused on like hosting physical events and in the meet space or real world. And similarly, like they they just built a lot of brand equity and culture momentum. And then it became so relevant that like Andreessen led around at a hundred million valuation and, and wanted to join the DAO. So wild. Amazing. And then maybe some highlights from 2022, the best DAO, the most improved DAO in your opinion. To Like the bar is low today. I think to be a very, very good DAO in 2022, you just have to keep relevance and keep people engaged. I think one that I feel like has done a very good job is Nouns DAO. I don't know if you follow it so much. It's a bit of an experiment launched by Dom Hoffman and a few other folks. I think there's 10 founders. Dom was uh, previously the founder of Vine that got acquired by Twitter, I believe. Um, and Nouns, basically the idea is that they have like um, a script to, to create a generative piece of low resolution art every 24 hours and then auction this art. And then the, the winner of the auction earns this noun and like you get this NFT, but the NFT doubles as a voting right over the pool of capital. So like the treasury is owned by the DAO. And I think that when we saw a, a market filled with a lot of art NFTs that didn't have like inherent value, whatever that means, or any other utility beyond being a PFP, 
um, this was like an alternative approach to say, okay, you're buying a pool, you're buying an NFT and it's expensive, but you're getting governance over this thing and uh, over this pool of capital, and we're also building a community of folks. I think Nouns has been pretty innovative and engaging. Um, they're also exploring more with like sub DAO governance and, and ways to become effective and not um, kind of go through the same, I guess, issues that that affect most DAOs. So I would probably give Nouns the best DAO of 2022 award. Amazing. Super exciting. And then for those that maybe haven't participated in a DAO, but they're curious, where would you point them to? Are there any communities that you would tell them to go to if they're they're new to DAOs? Yeah, I think just doing a lot of reading online is a good starting point. And look, DAOs are a very, very broad term. Like You can argue that most or all DeFi platforms are also DAOs because a lot of these have some form of governance token. Um, but I think of like where is there actually... A community and, and folks like engaged, I think Nouns is, is probably a great one to start. But it's it is important to also do your homework and learn about all of the DeFi platforms as well and like compound and go look at the history of compound governance and read their forums. Totally. Yeah, a lot you can do online. And then what about in person? Are there DAO specific events that you could point people to? Or do most DAOs kind of have their own in person events? Um, I think they did in 2021. I don't think those are so much of a thing anymore. Uh, but friends with benefits does in-person events. I don't know if they're still doing them, but I know that they were one of the more, uh, focused on creating like real world experiences. Totally. Amazing. Okay, cool. And then what are the biggest opportunities you see right now in crypto? What do you have your eye on for, for 2023? To be honest, I'm really excited about how there's like an air of sobriety in the industry again, and it's not so exuberant and doesn't have this sense that every time you go to a cafe anywhere in the world and sit down and have a coffee, you overhear a conversation about someone launching some like NFT project. So I think it's like time to just zero in and focus on the things that are working and the important building blocks for the space. So I'm a big fan and, and believer in the ZK rollup ecosystem. I think we're going to have multiple implementations of ZK EVMs. Um, just the whole ecosystem around scaling Ethereum and other L1s using ZK rollups is going to become more robust. Uh, as I mentioned, real world assets is an interesting use case. I think whoever manages to tackle a way to get like something that mirrors our high interest rate environment today into a financial asset that retail can buy on chain, it becomes interesting and earn a stable yield that's not correlated just with crypto trading. Like the biggest problem with DeFi is that all of this stuff was just used to fuel the gen gambling, whereas DeFi, borrow and lend in and of itself is a very innovative tool, but you need borrowers that are um, using the money for something that's not just like margin trading. Uh, gaming also, I think there will be big opportunities just because it's such a big segment that continues to grow. Um, I don't think the Axie Infinities of the world are the most sustainable, sustainable model. Like play to earn is a great way to incentivize early users. But it can't be so rewarding that the whole thing just turns into a giant click farm. That that just even if you have a good game, it, it destroys it. It's it's dead on arrival with that approach. So a lot of this is just about tapering the economics and getting them to a more sustainable level. Like we have to be happy with high single digit or low double digit yield in DeFi, not like one thousand percent APY is too low. Like that 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 era of twenty twenty one is over. I think totally. Yeah, and I guess with NFTs, I personally did not see it coming. I saw everything else. I did not see NFTs. What was what are your thoughts on kind of the, the NFT space? It's interesting to see so many traditional companies kind of adopting NFTs. But would love to hear your thoughts. I do believe that PFPs are a user behavior that will sustain. I don't think they're going to be necessarily as valuable as they were in the last cycle. I think people overpaid for a lot of these NFTs and like the mass mass majority the vast majority of them are just crap and are going to zero. But that's probably consistent with the broader art world. Like most art doesn't have any value and very few artists relative to the whole industry find meaningful commercial success and their work becomes timeless. The same is going to happen with NFTs. Um, and I just think groups like NounsDAO, I, I know I've been trumpeting them so much in this talk, but uh, even just like small innovations, like let's take the same framework, but also give you a governance right over a treasury. Let's add that to the NFT. Like over layering utility on this art, I think is going to be one of the more interesting phenomena. 
Totally. And I think that parallels too with the crypto space in general, right? 99% is arguably garbage, but uh, that 1% is really going to change the way we coordinate online. It's going to change the internet as we know it and and the monetary policy system. It's already changing. Um, So yeah, super exciting. But I do say the crypto punks are the Bitcoin of NFTs. Yeah. (laughs) And to be honest, if we look at what happened in 2021, I just think the same grifters who were going to start really bad ICOs in 2017 decided to start NFT projects in 2021. And it's really just a regulatory arb. It's because an ICO is probably an issuance of securities, or at least that's the conventional um, take that people have in the US. But selling NFTs isn't a securities law violation. So if I could just hire some digital artist and sell some random picture and market it on online, um, I, I can raise like large sums of money overnight to do nothing. So I just think that it's like it became a funnel for bad behavior. Totally. And it is sad that, you know, it would be nice if we stop enabling the grifters, right? Like even SBF was very honest early days that he was a mercenary. He is trading crypto because it's the most profitable thing he can trade. And still people pumped up his company to a $32 billion valuation. And I personally think that, you know, when greed kind of takes over, that's really when you're in a place where you're likely going to get hurt. So hopefully we can learn. Yeah. Three hours capitals raising another fund. So yeah, we'll see if, if we have learned. And the last question is just how are you defiant? Oh, cool. Is this like the um, closer question for all guests? Yes. I like it. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, I think to be honest, there's not someone who would commit their full life to crypto meaningfully if they weren't at some level inherently defiant or like, dissatisfied with the status quo. And I think in this conversation, we talked about bad behavior quite a bit and and kind of like the bad outcomes that can come in crypto. I'm actually not a huge believer of this narrative that crypto is the salvation for mankind and that we're all in this to bank the unbanked in Africa and that there's this like ESG undertone to the whole movement. I actually think crypto as a technology and and as an ecosystem or, or movement is incredibly harsh. It's kind of like live Darwinian economics. And it can be super brutal. All you have to do is look at how many people have gone from total obscurity to billionaire status and then bust again in such a short period of time. Um, So I don't think the like mission statement of crypto is to make wealth more egalitarian inherently, but it does significantly increase the velocity of wealth, which I think is a very defined thing inherently because wealth wants to be, or like wealth has historically been really driven by status quo. It moves hands very, very seldom throughout generations. But we've created this technology and we're leading this the movement of this technology that is the greatest wealth transfer solution that's ever existed in the history of humanity. Um, look, it doesn't always mean there's the most just outcomes. I think you'd probably agree that there's certain people in crypto that are like very, very, very rich who have contributed relatively little to the whole space. Um, but it does mean that the, the transfer happens much more and like the opportunity is there. Um, And I think just by virtue of having that velocity of wealth, it's a net huge positive for society. And it still beats the like alternative of having to work your way up some pyramid scheme, corporate ladder in the Western world. So um, I think the pursuit of crypto is very defiant still. Amazing. I love that. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the crypto is very much a meritocracy, right? With the peer to peer nature, it's really the value you put in, you can get compensated commensurate to that value, which, you know, coming from Wall Street, coming from the law field, it's not always the the case. So absolutely agree. Amazing. This was such a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Tegan. Appreciate it. Cheers. Appreciate it.